Good evening. Good evening, and um, thank you all for coming out here for our next installment of the Evening at Egan series. Tonight we have Mahler, Modernism and Resurrection, presented to us by Kyle Wiley Pickett, the music director of the Juno Symphony, and Robin Walls, associate professor of history here at UAS. And uh, I don't know how much introduction they need, but I will give it. Um, Kyle Pickett has been described as one of America's most exciting and charismatic young conductors. He holds a doctorate of music. <laughs> he holds a doctorate of musical arts conferred by the Peabody Conservatory in Baltimore and was appointed music director of the Juno Symphony in the year 2000. Um, he's also the musical, music director of the North State Symphony in Northern California, so we're very lucky to be sharing him. Um, over the past nine seasons, he has fostered the Juno Symphony and um, has brought it to a new level of artistry and has also introduced the popular Conversations with the Conductor series of pre-performance talks. And if any of you have been fortunate enough to hear any of them, you know what an engaging speaker Maestro Pickett is. Um, it's a, an honor and a pleasure to work with him, and I say this as a singer in the Juno Symphony Chorus. So, <clears throat> his co-presenter tonight is Robin Walls, who earned his PhD in history at the University of California in Davis, and teaches many history courses for us here, including histories, um, history surveys, uh, modern history surveys and others, and upper division courses that include European intellectual history, history of the Holocaust, and European popular culture. His book, Pulp Surrealism, Popular Culture in Early Modern, I'm sorry, Early 20th Century France, was published by the University of California Press in 2000. Um, he's published many other essays and articles on what he calls French criminals, detectives, and avengers. And uh, this includes an introduction to the classic 1911 crime novel, Fantoma, um, which is translated in English now. Um, he has also translated a surrealist crime parody called The Death of Nick Carter from French into English, and it's really good. You should find it and read it. And Rob, Robin Walls plays the cello in the Juno Symphony. And so without further ado, I will turn this evening over to the dynamic duo. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks, Nina. Uh, I mentioned on the radio last night, uh, I've thought, thinking of this evening in, in baseball metaphor, it's, uh, you know, it's playoff time. And so we're in the eighth inning here, and I'm the, I'm the setup man, and then <laughs> Kyle's going to be the closer. Um, let's see here. Let's, we'll get going here. I want to start off tonight just taking a, a couple minutes to talk about how my... Uh, prelude my, my encounter, my own personal encounter with hearing Mahler's Second Symphony, that the symphony will be doing next weekend for the first time. And um, um, I was living in San Francisco at the time, I think it was 1986, and uh, 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 Herbert Bloomstedt was the conductor of the San Francisco Symphony at the time, and uh, this woman down here is uh, named uh, Susan McCarthy. She was a friend, and she was singing in the chorus, and she was telling me about this, and she says, we're doing Mahler's sec second, you really gotta come, and, and I said, yeah, yeah, I would, and it was Sunday, Sunday afternoon, it was around noon or so, and like, I realized if I like, didn't hop on the bus and make it to Davies Hall, I like, wasn't going to hear it at all. This was it, the matinee, it was the last chance, and so, um, I rushed, I got in, everybody was already seated. I'm like running, I'm up in the nosebleed section. I'm having to run up all those flights of, you know, ramps and stuff. And the ushers let me in. Luckily, the music hadn't started yet, but, you know, and I, I sit down and, and just in time for like the, the, uh, the symphony to start. And, um, and like a, I had one of those Pavlovian responses of being like when I was a student and I'd go to uh, go to concerts, which is like I'd go in and I instantly fall asleep. 
And, uh, or it's not really you fall asleep, it's you kind of fade in and out. I don't know if you've had that experience in symphony. And you just kind of like get caught up in this dream thing. And, um, and then, it, you know, and it's, sim it's a really long symphony. And then at a certain point, um, at a certain point, if this works, oh no. <laughs> It wakes me up, you know, it wakes me up. Attention, it's the beginning of the fifth movement. And in, in, the, in, the, in the fifth movement, there's a lot of loud and then softs and other things like this. And then um, I'm kind of, my dream state has become kind of like a, a state of awareness at a certain point. And then there's this certain point, and this is going to be super soft, so we have to be really quiet here. be really quiet because it's like not playing. Okay, I'll just tell you about it. You'll get it for yourself. You'll get it from Kyle too, which is there's this point in which the chorus comes in and everything's been so loud and the chorus came in and it was so soft and I just like completely came apart. I just started like sobbing right in my seat in the, uh, in the thing. And those of you who know me, I'm, I'm not a particularly effusive person. I mean, I get, uh, you know, kind of uh, chastised for being uh, like all head and, you know, well, there's a heart there somewhere, but I don't wear it on my sleeve. And, uh, and what I realized, and the point was where I'm going with this story is that I didn't even know this symphony was called the Resurrection Symphony. And there I am, I am totally caught up in what's going on in this piece of music. I had no idea what I was going to, and at this moment, it, it happened. It completely happened for me. And this is where I'm gonna go with, with the uh, modernism. I'm gonna talk, Mahler had his effect on me. That's what I'm trying to say. And he did it not because I knew what I was going to, not because I, I didn't understand any of the words, I, didn't, I couldn't even tell what the words were that were being sung, and yet the effect was total and it was complete. Okay? Now, um, I wanna, I've got uh, three sets of slides here to go through, uh, and I want to talk about uh, Mahler's biography a little bit first, then I'm going to give you a really, really kind of quick version of what modernism is, and then wrap up with the sort of connections between Mahler and modernism, or some of them that I came across that I like very much. Uh, Gustav Mahler was born in uh, uh, July of 1860 in the uh, town of Iglau, Iglau. It's in Bohemia, uh, then called Bohemia. He was the second of 14 children born to Bernard Mahler and Marie Hermann. His father had been a coachman, but he uh, saved up and became the owner of his own small off-sales distillery. His mother was burdened by housework and her multiple pregnancies. Uh, eight of their children died in infancy or, or in early childhood. She was also uh, uh, abused emotionally, if not physically, by her husband, definitely emotionally. Now, Bernard's influences on Mahler, first of all, Gustav detested his father for being abusive toward his mother. He never forgave him for that. He, uh, even as late as uh, April 1910, in his famous stroll with Freud, the time that he spent four hours with Freud on a walk, and he complained about his father, <laughs> and the way, as the father's abuse toward his mother. But his father also positively instilled him with a love of the German language and culture. At this time, Bohemia was part of a vast Austrian empire, which was a multi-ethnic and multilinguistic conglomeration of peoples that today make up the countries of the Czech Republic, Slovakia, Hungary, Slovenia, Croatia, Bosnia, Herzegovina, and there were also multiple ethnic communities in addition of Poles, Ukrainians, Romanians, Italians, Jews, and Roma Gypsies. Okay, so you have all these peoples and cultures. The ethnic roots of the Mahler family were in the local Jewish community, and Bernard was an active member of it, yet he was a secularized Jew. He uh, prided himself as a liberal, free-thinking intellectual, preferring urban German language and philosophy to the rural Czech culture of the region where they were located. Uh, as a child, therefore, Gustav was raised speaking German as a first language, although he also received an orthodox uh, education. 
And he also developed a love of uh, folk poetry, uh, particularly the anthology uh, Des Knaben Wunderhorn, which you're going to hear about more, The Youth's Magic Horn. And Mahler would later rework some of those simple poems into his early symphonies, including the alto solo of the fourth movement of the second symphony. Uh, in adulthood, however, like his father, uh, Mahler would come to think of himself primarily as a modern, as a composer, conductor, artist, and intellectual, more than someone who sought roots in any particular ethnic or cultural tradition. Bernard's also the one who introduced Gustave to music by bringing home a pianoforte, uh, uh, an early version, a kind of parlor version from the 19th century that Gustave had discovered in his grandparents' attic, and then his father arranged for him to have music lessons. By age four, Gustave had mastered scales and the keyboard, but his father wanted him to be a virtuoso like Mozart. Uh, at age 10, Gustav gave his first public concert, which was well received, enough so that his father arranged for him to uh, attend music conservatory in Prague, uh, although his musical progress there was slow, unremarkable, but then the next part happens. He has some formative musical influences when he enters the Vienna Conservatory uh, in September of 1875. Uh, in Vienna, he found himself being instructed by some of the finest music, music teachers in Vienna. He uh, received piano lessons from Julius Epstein, harmony from, he studied harmony with Rachel, I mean, Robert Fuchs, I know, I know a woman named Rachel Fuchs, and composition by Franz Krenn. Uh, in addition to his conservatory studies, he attended university lectures on art, history, and music, most notably those by Austrian composer Anton Bruckner. And while he was never a pupil of Bruckner's, uh, Mahler and some of his conservatory colleagues were sort of befriended and adopted by Bruckner, who spent time with them um, and had a big influence on them as a result. Upon completing conservatory in 1878, Mahler joined the uh, Pennerstorfel Circle, which was an intellectual and political group of young people under the intellectual sway of Schopenhauer, Nietzsche, and above all, Richard Wagner. The notion of German musical genius embedded, uh, embodied in Bruckner and Wagner uh, appealed greatly to Mahler, and it furthered his trajectory toward secularization, assimilation, and modernity. Still, he was continually aware of his outsider status throughout his life. He was fond of saying, I'm thrice homeless as a Bohemian in Austria, an Austrian among Germans, as a Jew throughout the world, Everywhere an intruder, never welcomed. Um, Mahler also began, began uh, composing during these years. He wrote something called a Nordic Symphony. We don't have it anymore. And his earliest extant work, which was a folktale operetta uh, called Das uh, Klagende Lied, or The Song of Lament, he uh, entered a piece for the Beethoven Prize in 1881, which was open to current and past uh, Vienna Conservatory students, but he failed to win a prize, which meant the next part on the, on the uh, uh, chart here, he became an opera conductor. Uh, as a consequence of not gaining immediate recognition as a composer, he went through a 16-year process of moving up the hierarchy in the musical world by being an opera conductor. While working in numerous European cities at the time, his most important posts were in these cities of Prague, Leipzig, Budapest, and Hamburg. Uh, he continued to compose during these years, uh, and in those effort, efforts, he benefited from the practical challenges of being a conductor. He had to write incidental music when it was needed. He completed or reconstructed uh, incomplete works, and he staged both canonical and contemporary operas. As an opera director, he developed a, a dual and sometimes contra contrary perspective on musical productions. On the one hand, he insisted on total control over all aspects of the production, and he felt it was his sacred duty to understand the intentions of a composer when performing a work. On the other hand, he accepted that when a musical work is handed over to a conductor, it artistically becomes what the conductor makes of it. That's why sometimes those things are intention. Mahler also wrote his first three symphonies during this period, okay? uh, collectively known as these Knaben-Wunderhorn symphonies for his use of the folk poems in the libretti. Uh, 
Uh, the first symphony uh, premiered in Budapest in 1889, and then he underwent multiple revisions and performances for the next decade. He wrote the first movement of the second symphony in 1881, but didn't complete it till seven years later. I'm sure Kyle will talk about this. And then the third symphony was written in uh, 1895 and 96. Uh, three movements were performed in Berlin the next year, but the full sim uh, uh, symphony wasn't first performed until 1903. What's important about this in terms of his biography is that it's during these years in which he gained renown as a conductor, and he was continually maneuvering to try to get his way back into Vienna, which he did. He accomplished that in February of 1897. He gained an appointment as the director of the Imperial Court Opera of the Emperor. In April of that year, Mahler conducted his final performance in Hamburg, and he moved to Vienna, where he found himself on the margins of power. Okay. Becoming a musical conductor for the emperor meant that he also had to convert to Catholicism, which he did on February 23rd, 1897. On the one hand, as a non-practicing Jew, he didn't consider conversion all that big a deal. Uh, I, I invented a phrase, Vienna is worth a mass. That, <laughs> He didn't say that. It was, it was, that was Henry, Henry IV of France to become king of France. But I, I, think, it, I think it applies. Uh, but for Viennese Jews of all persuasion, April uh, 1897, the same month that Mahler arrives in Vienna, was a terrible portend. Because that month, Karl Luger, who was a virulently anti-Semitic and reactionary nationalist from the Christian Social Party, was elected mayor of Vienna. Now, Vienna had always been a politically conservative center of Central Europe. Uh, the seated Habsburg dynasty had been the Holy Roman Emperors in Vienna, with the exception of two generations in Spain, for half a millennium. But the kind of modern anti-Semitism represented by Luger, the kind that pits pure German national identity against, quote, the degenerate influence of Jews, was wholly new and unexpected, largely. Because for the past 50 years, since the revolutions of 1848, a liberalizing political attitude, one that included the political emancipation of Jews, had been growing in Austrian society. Vienna itself embodied something of the new spirit of the age in, it, in, in the way that the city was laid out, in the Ringstrasse, which was a vast urbanization project that transformed a former military parade into a marvelous circular boulevard at the city center. And it was lined with, uh, uh, with new government buildings and municipal buildings and multi-storied apartments and corporate businesses and also a new opera house and an art history museum, which would later be decorated in the Sessionist or Art Nouveau style by Gustav Klimt. Um, the glory of Vienna was that of Imperial Austria itself, both politically and culturally, thoroughly modern, End of the century Vienna aspired to become the center of both German and European culture over the urban rivals of Prague and Budapest in Central Europe, over Berlin and Munich in Germany, and perhaps even over Paris and London. Uh, Vienna was also a city in which a number of influential Jewish artists and intellectuals were making their mark, including but not limited to uh, the poet Hugo von Hofmannsthal. Uh, journalist Karl Krauss, novelist Stefan Zweig, uh, the psychologist Sigmund Freud, uh, philosophers uh, Otto uh, Weininger and Lud Ludwig Wittgenstein, and the composer Arnold Schoenberg, and also Gustav Mahler. Uh, it was his cultural identification with this politically and intellectually progressive element that made it easier for Mahler to convert to Catholicism in order to gain Vienna. According to cultural historian Stephen Bellmer, uh, quote, as far as the outer trappings of assimilation went, he'd gone far, uh, perhaps farther than any person of Jewish dis descent could expect to get in uh, politically conservative and Catholic Vienna. Yet even though he gained that position in the imperial court uh, as the imperial court opera director, over the next 10 years, he lived in Vienna. Mahler was criticized for being a musical polyglot rather than a German composer. 
As the Italian composer Alfred Casella wrote uh, in a review of the Second Symphony, quote, it's impossible to imagine anything so dissimilar as the various elements of which every one of his symphonies is made up. Constant variety, superabundant abundant imagination, these are the prime impressions transmitted by this strange music in which an iron hand unites and fuses the apparently most disparate melodic, rhythmic, and harmonic elements. The pratter of low German is mixed with Hungary, and they join hands in Prague. Now, some of the musicians in his own orchestra were no less generous, calling the piece, the second, quote, a mistake in orchestration that one learns to avoid during the first year of conservatory. Uh, an article in the Deutsche Zeitung after April 9th, 1899, performance of the symphony, declared that only a, quote, almost exclusively Jewish audience applauded the concert with a wild enthusiasm that defied all rules of decency. Okay, this, <laughs> this is the kind of climate that he's having to live and work and produce and produce new works and new music in. Um, anyway, I think I'll just go ahead and move on to the next bit and skip what I had next. Now, here's a brief detour. Mahler and modernism. What is modernism? And then I'm going to talk a little bit more particularly about Mahler and modernism. Uh, I'll try to be brief here. Apparently, there's a great debate. I, I love doing these talks with Kyle because like, I learn all this stuff. I, I know some of the modernism, but didn't know a lot about Mahler before I like, sit down and start reading. And by the way, I'm going to talk about this book here in a bit. This is by Julian Johnson. It's called Mahler's Voices. It's brand new. just came out last year in 2009. Mahler's Voices, Expression and Irony in the Songs and Symphonies. Out of all the books that I read, this is like the most outstanding, and I highly, highly recommend it. Um, OK. Apparently, there are, there's a great debate between musicologists who view Mahler as a late romantic and those who see him as a modernist. There are others who try to finesse it by saying, well, in the early period, he was a romantic, and the middle period, he was a modernist, and in the late period, he tried to reconcile them. Uh, the problem with these kinds of approaches, according to Johnson, is, quote, while this is not entirely inaccurate, it blurs the extent to which the constructive, self-conscious attitude toward musical language, I'm slowing down there because of those words, constructive, self-conscious attitude toward musical language is presented from Mahler's earliest published works to his latest and the most constructive of works. In other words, the two, romanticism and moder modernism, are never mutually exclusive in Mahler, but are rather intertwined modalities in his, of his musical speech. Now, I'm sure many of you have been to the symphony, so I'm not going to talk about romanticism, but I'm going to try to get a few kind of basic comments. This is a crash course in modernism. Uh, over a period of roughly four decades, from about 1890 to 1930, some European artists, writers, composers, architects, ar uh, architects, and intellectuals tried to rework Western civilization on an entirely new basis, more in sync, they believed, with modernizing society and culture, a project we broadly call modernism. Now, the various modernist movements are incredibly diverse. There's no common aesthetic that unites expressionism, cubism, futurism, Dada, surrealism, constructivism, neoplasticism, abstract expressionism, the new objectivity, Bauhaus, purism, and it goes on and on. There are a lot of modernist movements. However, all modernist movements share the pithy imperative expressed by uh, Ezra Pound, make it new. That is, all modernist movements placed a high value upon innovation and novelty, and they tried to make art that transcended contemporary life and elevates the viewer, reader, or audience above the mon mundane. And, he, and in this, uh, an intellectual historian uh, who, uh, who, who helped train me, his name was Eugene Lunn, he uh, died very prematurely. He, he wrote a book on uh, modernism in which he laid out four contours. Uh, and the first one has to do with subjective and self-reflexive art. Uh, in modernist art, aesthetics, that is what's judged to be beautiful and true, doesn't stem from classical forms. It doesn't come out of a romantic spirit, but it's something discovered in the work of art itself. That is, the artist, the writer, composer, I'm going to say artist over, but think composer, writer, the full, the full uh, spread, uh, 
The artist invests meaning in the work of art, both through the media materials and then the forms of construction of those materials. Whatever the artist's intentions, it's the work of art itself that is supposed to convey the meaning. So the artistic meaning becomes highly subjective. It becomes personal and experiential, both for the artist who creates it and for the viewer, the reader, or the audience who has a direct subjective experience of the work of art. Second, simultaneity, simultaneities of time and space. The quickest way to get to this notion is the notion of stream of consciousness, this idea. Uh, during this period of time, across intellectual disciplines, mathematics, physics, philosophy, psychology, uh, phenomenology, which combine the two, the notion that people experience multiplicities of time and space on an everyday basis, which is a condition we have exacerbated today by instantaneous electronic communication, this, this took hold for the first time. The point is that the outside world ceases to be naturalistic and it becomes more conditional, and it becomes self-evidently constructed. While a work of art may produce a, a sense or a feeling of unity, in fact, multiple and often diverse elements have simply been placed together. Uh, initially, art like this was thought of shocking. When cubism, collage, surrealism, when these things happened for the first time, people thought they were shocking. But today, tru truly, it's, it's totally banal, and the perfect example of this is TV. There's, there's nothing natural about TV. You know, just watch, even watch how it's constructed sometime, and you think it's just like common and every day, but there is nothing natural about TV. Uncertainty of meaning. Uh, one of the major goals of modernism was to defamiliarize the world, to draw attention to the fact that modern life is not natural, it's not organic or holistic, but it's constructed, historically constructed, and it's continually undergoing transformation. That's why modernist art often tried to provoke viewers and audiences, to challenge people to examine the contemporary world, perceive it differently, and then find their own and uncertain meaning in it. And then fourth, a notion of constructed human nature. This is the idea that humanism is over that humans are no longer the measure of all things, but are constructed or fashioned like everything else in the modern world. It's not that there's no longer human nature, but whatever nature humans come up with, that's been constructed out of the materials of the modern world, both materially and culturally, that world we live in, that modern world we live in. In modernism, humans no longer have an essential organic or inner core, rather the human psyche is seen as being fashioned through a field of sensations, perceptions, images, objects. And now here I'll go to, to uh, uh, Mahler. Mahler, and this is my final slide. Mahler is early modernist. With these contours in mind, I want to highlight three key insights that I took away from this book by Julian Johnson, Mahler's Voices. And I think it may be helpful when you listen to the, I hope it is, to the Mahler Second Symphony. First is the notion of a world of relations, finding poetry in the plurality of voices. Johnson finds sympathies between how Mahler constructed his symphonies and modernist ideas about the philosophy of language, specifically the notion that, quote, language is the medium in which thought takes place rather than something separate from thought. We can only think through what we can express in language, and we can only express what we have thought. What's notable here is that while Mahler was deeply influenced by the German Romantic tradition in music, in fact, the construction of his symphonies continually violate the rules of composition. That Mahler doubted whether his symphonies could, doubt, Mahler himself doubted whether symphonies could create a unified sense of identity, and certainly whether a performance of a symphony could instill that in listening audiences. Instead, Johnson emphasizes, Mahler em embraced a plurality of voices in his time. Quote, more often than not, the musical elements in his symphonies derive from the folk and street music that recall Mahler's own accounts of Iglau, as if his Czech origins could never be completely denied despite his success in the imperial capital. And as such, they constitute the eruption of the popular, the ephemeral, the ethnic, and the worldly elements from which the imperial institutions of art, like the Vien uh, Vienna Conservatory, might seem very distant. In other words, Kahler, Mahler was caught up in the tensions between different linguistic and ethnic cultures, uh, both in his personal and professional life, and he made his symphonies express this. The inner program, 
It's not what the program notes say, it's what the composer makes go on inside of you. It's well known that Mahler hated program notes. By the time he wrote the Fourth Symphony, he had abandoned them altogether, he refused to write program notes anymore. The symphony program is not what one reads in a booklet, he thought, it's what actually goes on in the music that the audience experiences. Uh, as he wrote in a letter to a friend uh, in 1901, there is no modern music from Beethoven onwards that doesn't have an inner program. Now, he also refused to like discuss what he meant by an inner program. But its impulse seems to have been strongly modernist. As Johnson puts it, uh, Mahler anticipated Schoenberg and his pupils in retreating into silence on the question of the inner program, but the continuity of aesthetic, he says, between them, uh, between them, between Mahler and Schoenberg, this is, this is more significant than the outward differences in their musical styles. And then lastly, the dissolution of individuality, discovering human identity through artistic constructions rather than seeking its essential core. The idea here is that we discover our own nature not by looking into ourselves, but by abandoning ourselves to art, language, and music. Uh, Johnson emphasizes that Mahler didn't uh, think humans were objects molded out by mechanical structures. He didn't have a culture factory model going on. Uh, other modernists did. Uh, Mahler also hated what he's called amorphous or merely coloristic art as, quote, too shapeless and vague, jelly and primeval slime, constantly calling for life but unable to gestate. In, in other words, he wouldn't like New Age music either. <laughs> Rather, uh, Johnson finds Mahler's musical aesthetic in the, in the poet uh, Hugo von Hofmannsthal's notion of abandoning oneself to language. And this is Hofmannsthal's quote. The creative individual, surrounded by all too restricted forms of expression, as though by walls, casts himself into language and tries to find in it the drunkenness of inspiration. Through it, opens up entries into life in accordance with those senses of meaning which are freed from the control of conscious understanding. It occurs not in half-dreamy self-indulgence, but through an intense self-removal in intoxication. Through a simultaneous piling up of objects a violation of order. In other words, it happens by immersing oneself in the dissolution of individuality. And that's what happened for me the first time I heard Mahler's Second Symphony being performed by the uh, San Francisco Symphony and Chorus under the direction of Herbert Blumstedt in Davies Hall 24 years ago. Okay, all right, thanks, that's, that's it for my part. We're going to have a quick technology change here, and then we'll yeah. go on. Thank you very much, Robin. That's great. We, we are going to um, try to make sure we leave time at the end for questions, because uh, they're, both Robin and I have a propensity to talk on and on, and so we want to make sure that we, we leave room for any, any questions that came up. And uh, that was very interesting. There it is. There it is. Okay, good. Okay. Well, I, I want to uh, just very quickly thank you all for being here tonight. I'm, I'm really pleased to see such a big turnout, and I want to thank Robin especially. I think uh, those are really interesting points about modernism, and I have to admit that uh, modernism is not something that I know an awful lot about, and, and I would not ever uh, call myself a Mahler scholar. Here, uh, but I do uh, I do love his his symphonies, his music, and uh, he was a great hero of mine, uh, or is a great hero of mine as as a conductor. And really, when we uh, when we think about Mahler today, we tend to think of him as as a composer, and his symphonies are among the most popular works, certainly at the larger orchestras throughout the world. Uh, but during his day, uh, 
uh, he was not really considered much of a composer. And uh, that's for a couple reasons, but one is because his output was limited pretty significantly by his conducting schedule. Uh, as, as, a, as a working conductor, I know how little time you have, and the time that you do spend is immersed in other people's music. Uh, and certainly for someone like Mahler, who was conducting operas, you know, such big works and kind of constantly uh, scheduled in the operas, he really didn't have much time to compose. And so his output was fairly limited. He, he wrote pretty much only symphonies and song cycles. Uh, he never did an opera. He didn't do much, you know, really any chamber music to speak of. There were no piano compositions. There were no string quartets. And, and that was the kind of music that really gained a composer his reputation, the kind of music that could be sold and played by ordinary folks, uh, not pieces that take 135 you know, performers to perform. That's, that's a tough thing to get played regularly. And so he had to be the champion of his own music. And, um, and as Robin mentioned, you know, he came to Vienna right at a time when, uh, when being a Jew was a, was a serious liability as a, as a composer, as a performer. And uh, he died you know, in 1911. And, and shortly after that was World War I, and then after World War I was a time in, in the German-speaking countries when, when the music of Jews was, was not performed. It was considered to be you know, that uh, degenerate music against the German culture. And so it really wasn't until after 1945, after the end of World War II, that his music was able to be performed with any regularity. And uh, Leonard Bernstein deserves a lot of the credit for bringing Mahler back to, or, well, maybe not even back to, but into the public consciousness as an important composer and, and certainly as an important symphonist. Um, I, I enjoyed hearing what Robin had to say, and, and I'm going to fall in with the fuzzy middle ground of musicologists who say that Mahler was kind of in tension with himself over modernism and, uh, and romanticism, that there certainly is a strong romantic streak. Uh, and in fact, anybody who was writing symphonies is not making it new. On the other hand, what he did with his symphonies certainly was making it new, and so he, he negotiated that tension, I think, with, with his composition. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit. What I'm going to do today, uh, what I really want to do most today, is walk you through the structure of the Second Symphony. Uh, as, as I'm sure most of you know, the, the Juno Symphony is playing Mahler's Second Symphony next weekend, so next Saturday and, and Sunday, Saturday night and Sunday afternoon. I hope that all of you will be able to come to the concert. Um, and so um, it, it is a large work. It's, it's on a massive scale. It's the only piece that we're playing on the program. It's about an 80-minute long symphony, which makes it among the longest symphonies, bested really only by other Mahler symphonies. And, and a couple, a couple Bruckner symphonies, and as we heard, Bruckner was one of the influences on Mahler. Um, my introduction to the piece was very similar to Robbins. It was right after, actually, it was right. It was during my senior year of college, and it was also at the San Francisco Symphony. And I also went in not knowing anything about the piece, not really ever having heard the piece. I went in. I didn't read the program notes. And I was also in that college student sleepy time where you kind of go in and out of consciousness during, during performances and had a very similar response as well that, you know, that I, you, you can't drift off in the first movement. It's pretty powerful and exciting, but the second and third movements, they, they go on for a while and, and, uh, and they're quiet and the fourth movement's very quiet and then the fifth movement begins with that enormous bang that you will hear because I will play that for you. Um, and, and then you come undone. And it is, a, it is a remarkable thing to come undone so completely without knowing anything about the piece. And when you know something about the piece, I think you come undone even more. I, I, I had the privilege of conducting this piece two, th three years ago now um, with the North State Symphony. And it was interesting to see the audience response. Uh, I mean, we expect the musicians to have a particular response, but it was interesting to see the audience response. Uh, I had been thoroughly dissuaded by the board, or the board tried to dissuade me from doing the piece. My, my board of directors, they said, this is Redding, California. Nobody knows Mahler. <laughs> uh, you know, it's a hick town, they said. I didn't say. They said. <laughs> this is being broadcast on the internet, so I have to be careful. <laughs> and, um, you know, you looked out after the performance, and there wasn't a dry seat in the house. People were weeping in their seats. 
An elderly gentleman nearly fell down the stairs when he was coming down from the balcony. His legs were just gave out on him, and he had to be helped down with two people on either side of him because he was so overwhelmed and emotionally moved by the experience of hearing this piece. And that, that's particularly why what Robin had to say about modernism, about the way that music is supposed to reach you, is, is very interesting and I think very applicable to this piece. So let's, let's get to it. Let's talk about the piece itself. Um, Gustav Mahler, uh, born 150 years ago. Next year will have died, uh, will have, died 100 years ago. Um, he had a number of significant works. It's, it's actually hard to make a list of his significant works because he had so, so few works that really every one of them was significant. But I wanted to just list a few so you had a sense of the, of the span of his career. And really the first, I think, of his, of his very important compositions was the Wayfarer songs in 1886. And then right away he went on with his Symphony No. 1 in 1888, which actually used material from the Wayfarer songs in that sym symphony. Went on with his Symphony No. 2. It's a little bit hard to put a date on the second symphony because it was composed over a seven-year period of time, in some, some parts concurrently with the composition of the first symphony. Uh, then we have Des Knaben Wunderhorn, uh, which is the, the cycle of, of songs that he wrote to this poetry that Robin mentioned. Um, and again, it's a little bit hard to put a date on it. That's the date when it was written out for orchestra and voice, but he had written it out for piano and voice before that. His fourth symphony uh, was in 1900, his fifth symphony in 1902. Those were definitely that middle period, and, and really probably were more modernist than the early symphonies, which were a little bit more romantic in their sensibility. His symphony number no. eight in 1907, um, oops, I have a couple typos in there. Das Lied von der Erde was not 1809, it was 1909, and his ninth symphony was in 1909. Das Lied von der Erde actually was his ninth symphony, but Mahler was, uh, was obsessed with death, and somewhat superstitious, and, and realized that Beethoven died when he finished his Ninth Symphony, and Schubert died when he finished his Ninth Symphony, and Bruckner died when he finished his Ninth Symphony, and so he thought he would cheat and write his Ninth Symphony, but not call it his Ninth Symphony. <laughs> then he would go ahead and write his next symphony, but call it his Ninth Symphony, but it's really his Tenth Symphony. <laughs> but then he died. He did. Uh, he started his 10th symphony, but he didn't finish it. And so that was the, the sketch and the, a couple movements from the 10th symphony and the sketch. And actually, various musicologists have completed his 10th symphony, so there are performing editions of his 10th symphony, but he did not live to, to finish his 10th numbered symphony. Um, the, the obsession with death is important. And uh, Robin mentioned that, I think, was it six or eight of his children who died in, in, in infancy? Siblings, I'm sorry, siblings. Eight, eight of his siblings died in infancy. Um, that meant that eight, eight lived on, I think. Um, six? Yeah, thanks. I said I was not a Mahler expert. <laughs> not a mathematician either. Um, and so he was surrounded by death, and it was tragic, and it was, it was terrible for him. I mean, you know, he had siblings die when, you know, when he was a young boy, and, and uh, his mother died young. Uh, later in life, um, one of his daughters died, and that was, that was a tragedy that he really never did recover from. Uh, he thought about death constantly. Uh, he was worried about his own death and his own health, and he was worried about the deaths of his family members and his friends. So death, death, death was kind of constantly on his mind. Um, this piece, The Resurrection, uh, he really began it in 1884, and, and the reason it's a little bit complicated to date is because the first movement of the symphony, he had originally written as an entire piece. I mean, he considered it to be a whole. And uh, it had even a, a bit of a title, um, which was Funeral Rites. Um, and and he, he had considered writing it as a whole symphony, and then he crossed out that idea, and then he thought he would deal with it as a tone poem, and then he set it aside for quite a while, uh, and then didn't come back to it for three years. And then when he came back to it, he wrote the rest of the movements of the, of the symphony. And it had its premiere in 1895. And that's when I really consider it to be kind of completed. Um, it's, 
It is interesting that he wrote the first movement separately from the other movements because as you'll see as I talk about this piece, it, it is really an integral and organic whole. And, and the mo motivic ideas that he came up with in that first movement carry through all the way to the end of the symphony. Uh, and I'll talk about that in, in just a moment um, and, and I will, um, I'll respond to, uh, to Robin's thoughts about program notes too because those are important. But I also wanted to give you a sense of, of the context where this piece falls and this relates to the romanticism versus modernism idea as well. And if you look at this, I put Beethoven's Ninth Symphony on there for a reference point. So Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, which is definitely you know, the height of the early Romantics. I mean, Beethoven launched the Romantic era in music really in 1803 with his Third Symphony. And the height, or as far as it went, was, was 1824. And when I describe Mahler's Second Symphony to folks who don't know the piece, I often say it's like Beethoven's Ninth Symphony on steroids. <laughs> and I think that's actually still a pretty accurate description of, of what this piece actually really is. Wagner's Ring Cycle uh, was composed over a period of about 26 years but it was finished in 1874. Brahms, Johannes Brahms, who really carried on the romantic tradition of Beethoven to, uh, some might say, its, its logical conclusion in the 19th century, finished his fourth symphony in 1885, only 10 years before this Mahler symphony. Tchaikovsky finished his sixth and final symphony in 1893. Debussy, over in France, who we think of as an impressionist composer coming out of the Romantic era, but really, as we approach the turn of the century, becomes very modernist in his own aesthetic, writes Prelude to the Afternoon of a Fawn in 1894, and then Mahler's Second Symphony is there in 1895. Then Richard Strauss launches his reputation as the bad boy of German music and German opera with his opera Salome in 1905, and that is clearly, clearly modernist in every conceivable way. Um, he returns to Romanticism, Richard Strauss does, returns to Romanticism with Rosenkavalier a bit later, but 1905 marks Salome. Uh, Mahler, incidentally, as a conductor, wanted to bring Salome to the Vienna Opera and was denied the chance to do it because of the censors, because of uh, the salacious material in, in the opera. Then Stravinsky uh, writes his Firebird Ballet in 1910, and again, we're, we're, we're deep in the heart of modernism by then. So he's a transitional, he's writing in a transitional time when he writes this, this second symphony. So what I want to do today with you with this is take you through the structure of this piece because it is a gigantic work, because it occupies a whole concert worth of material. And Mahler was pretty clear about the fact that it was supposed to be a whole concert. Uh, conductors who tried to put other music on the program with that piece, uh, Mahler was always pretty skeptical and he said, look, this, you know, it's a big piece. It, it, it covers a lot of ground and it's really worth having by itself on a program. Um, because it's such a big piece, I want to, to talk through the various sections and then I'm going to talk you through uh, each movement of the piece as well. But I want to say an, a note about, about program notes because Mahler did not like doing them. I mean, Robin's right and he eventually stopped doing them. Uh, but early on he wrote quite a lot of program notes. In fact, he wrote three different sets of program notes for this second symphony. And, uh, and the program notes are very detailed, and I'm going to go through with you some of the things that he wrote about this piece, because I think it does shed quite a bit of light on the ideas behind the piece. Uh, but I tend to believe that Mahler's aversion to program notes had less to do with the modernist idea that the work should uh, speak to you without notation than the conflict that has existed, it's an age-old conflict that exists uh, in the musical world uh, between composers, and that is the idea of absolute music versus program music. And absolute music is, is most simply put, music that is about music. And program music is music that's about something else. And I'll give two real quick examples. An example of absolute music is Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, which we all know, right? Ba -ba -ba -ba. That's Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. Beethoven's Fifth Symphony is about Ba, 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 ba. That's what Beethoven's Fifth Symphony is about. And then he spends a half an hour working out that, that idea, that musical idea. Uh, program music would be something like Mahler's Second Symphony, which is about a funeral rite that then progresses to an idea of the final judgment and, 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 uh, and resurrection. And so there's an external dramatic idea 
that is being represented in the music. Now, that doesn't mean, for instance, that that a, a, a piece would would necessarily try to imitate any particular sounds. So, uh, even though you know we we can do nature sounds pretty easily in music, it, it, it's not it's not about trying to sound like you know, the stream and, and the Rhine River and that kind of thing. Uh, but there are musical ideas that stand for philosophical and dramatic ideas, and those are being played out. Now, in the, the mid part of the 19th century in Germany, there was a real fight about whether program music or absolute music was the higher calling in music. And that fight was carried out partly through the debate between Brahms and Wagner, and this is a debate that we can see framed in the terms of Romanticism versus Modernism. Because with Romanticism, you have, you have Brahms, who's carrying on the tradition of Beethoven, and he's writing works that are absolute music, and he's writing them in a very sophisticated version of a symphony form, which is a structure, it's a framework, it's a set of rules under which music is composed. Then you have Wagner and Liszt, who decide that everything that can be said with the symphony was said with Beethoven, didn't need to be said anymore, and we're going to go in a new direction, and that direction is going to be programmatic, and that fits in with the ideas of modernism in some ways. And so you had this conflict there. And I think in some ways Mahler was himself conflicted about which camp he wanted to be seen to be, to be living in, really. And so I think there, there, were, there was a time when, when he said, and, and Robin alluded to this, there is a program by the piece, but I'm not going to tell you what it is. And so the, the note, he, he, he hedged his bets, and he drew that fine line, and he said, it is program music, but the audience doesn't need to know the program. They'll figure it out themselves. So that's where things end up in later times. For the second symphony, we actually have some very specific programs, and, and I'm going to talk about that now. So this symphony, this giant symphony, is structured in five movements or five different segments. The first one is uh, Allegro Maestoso. This is the Toten Fire or the Funeral Rites, and this is the piece that he wrote to, as a standalone work. It's about 25 minutes long, and it's one large funeral. Um, there's a funeral march in there, and there's, there's a funeral ceremony in there, and there are ideas about death, and a lot of the ideas that are going to carry through the symphony are all included in that first movement. The second movement is shorter. It's about 10 minutes. And it's an andante moderato. It's a slower movement, and it's based on dance forms. It's much lighter. It's not nearly as dark and stormy and powerful as the first movement. The third movement is a scherzo, Die Welt wie im Hohlspiegel, Hol Hol The World as in a Concave Mirror. And uh, it's also much lighter than the first movement. The second and third movements are much lighter. Um, <coughs> they are much more of that folk influence that Robin spoke of, the, the Czech influence and the German Lendler folk music influence. Then we have the fourth movement, which is called Urlicht, which means primeval light. And this is a little song. It's a five-minute movement, and which is funny. The proportion of a five-minute movement in these, this, move, this symphony of large scales, uh, it's a song from Des Knaben Wunderhorn, the, the youth's magic horn folk poems that, that Mahler had set prior to writing the symphony, and then we go to the, f the finale, the apocalyptic vision, and the finale is huge. It's 35 minutes long. And the finale itself, one movement is as long as Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. So it's, it's a large work. Interestingly, interestingly, because of the time lag between the composition of the first movement and then the second, third, fourth, and fifth movements um, of three years, there, there's a real stylistic shift between the first and second movements. And Mahler was concerned about this stylistic shift. And so he calls for something very unusual, perhaps unique, in, in the symphonic repertoire, which is at the end of this first stormy movement, this, this funeral rites, he makes a little notation in the score to the conductor that says, at the end of this movement, you are to take a pause of at least five minutes before proceeding to the second movement. Which is a strange thing to say. Take a pause of five minutes, of at least five minutes. And so I, I elect to take a short intermission, not a full length intermission, but take a short intermission and let people's ears kind of clear out. Uh, another story about the San Francisco Symphony, 
my uh, principal trumpet player for my other orchestra, the North State Symphony, went to San Francisco State in the 70s, and that was when Seiji Ozawa was conducting the San Francisco Symphony. And he went, uh, Brian went to see a performance of Mahler's Second Symphony, and, and Seiji had a chair set up right next to the podium. And so when he finished the first movement, he got off the podium, sat down, sat down, it's being broadcast, I better stay in the mic. Sat down in the chair, looked at his watch, faced the audience, crossed his arms, and just sat. <laughs> For five minutes, looked at his watch, stood back up, got up on the podium, and went on with the piece. And he said the audience just sat there saying, what on earth is he doing here? <laughs> And, and I think that disruption actually goes a little bit against what Mahler was asking for in this. But part of what precipitated Mahler's decision to do that was at one of the early performances, uh, Debussy and uh, Ducat and Dandy, three of the great French composers of this turn of the century, came to see a performance of Mahler's Second Symphony. They sat through the first movement, found it to be very powerful. The second movement started, and about halfway through the second movement, they felt that this just did not live up to the first movement, and they got up and walked out, <laughs> which really hurt Mahler. He was actually pretty upset by this. And so he, he, he wrote a, a letter to one of his friends and, and said, you know, I know that the second movement doesn't quite fit with the first movement, but it's too late. I've already written them, and I don't want to go back and change it. And so that's why he put this pause in there. So. There are certain thematic ideas that Mahler wrote into the first movement that he carried through to the end of the, of the symphony that have extra musical meaning or, or meaning as part of this dramatic program. And so I want to go through these themes before I walk you through each of the movements. And, and knowing these themes, you will have a lot greater understanding of what's happening throughout this piece. And Mahler uses these themes in a really interesting way. Uh, the, the themes are really musical building blocks. Um, and, and those building blocks are based on, on symbols or musical symbolism that stand for certain concepts in here. Um, and it creates a real unity of construction in this piece. So even though it's this giant 80 minute long work, it's not, uh, it's not random or haphazard. It doesn't wander. It's very tightly wound together. And the themes actually provide a dramatic subtext for the piece. And if we think back again to the things that Robin was talking about, the, the social and philosophical ideas that were propagating and with Freud in, in Vienna, subtext was one of the very important ideas, this idea of, of a meaning that was beneath the surface. And so Mahler uses these ideas as, as a musical subtext. And the first one, the important one, is the cross motif. And you'll see that up at the top. It doesn't matter if you can't read music. I'm going to play some examples so that you can hear them. And the cross motif is one that, that Mahler did not himself invent. It was actually sort of invented by, by Franz Liszt. And there are sort of musicological tricks as to why these particular notes, these three notes, represent the, the cross. Uh, but Mahler chose to use this cross motif kind of pervasively through the symphony and, and, and takes that cross and, and turns it later on into the resurrection motif. Now, Robin mentioned that, that Mahler was a non-observant Jew, and he converted to Catholicism really for the job. He, he never was an observant Catholic either. I mean, he, he seemed to be actually religiously unaffiliated, uh, but that didn't mean that he, he wasn't interested in a lot of the ideas behind a lot of the world religions. In fact, he, he said when he was writing this piece, he scoured all the world's books and couldn't come up with anything, so he wrote his own text. And so, you know, out of all the world books, nothing really expressed what he was going to say, but he did want to express these ideas of resurrection and, and did rely on, on Christian symbol, symbolism, certainly. So the cross motif that I'm going to play uh, moves into the resurrection motif, which then moves into the eternity motif, which then touches the DS ray, which I'll talk about a little bit in, in a moment uh, before it goes on into a new section. So I'm going to play the first example that I'm going to play here uses all three of those. It's this section that you see it measures 282 to 290 there. And you'll hear the cross motif, the resurrection motif, the eternity motif, and then the DS ray. Gloria, if you're back there, can you turn our volume up a little bit? We're, we're turned down. I'd like to get it a little bit louder. 
Um, the eternity motif is very important because when we get to the end of the symphony, we're going to hear that that's then going to morph into the ascension motif. And so we're kind of constantly moving from these fate motifs and uh, through the cross motif, through the resurrection motif, to the eternity motif. And let's hear a little bit of that right now. Okay, now the Dies Irae um, is, is an ancient hymn tune, it's a 13th century hymn tune um, that comes out of the, the Catholic tradition um, and it's, it is part of the mass that is said for the dead. Um, and it has a particular melody, di ta ti ta ti ta ta, that you can see up. That's that's actually one of the texts from, I think, the maybe 14th or 15th centuries, but it shows the Dies Irae, and it's been used many times by many many different composers. Um, when whenever they're dealing with death, and a couple of the uh, good examples of that would be Berlioz in his Symphony Fantastique uses quotes from the Dies Irae, um, and um, I think in the Danse Macabre there's the Dies Irae, and then of course. Many of the composers wrote their own version of the DSE, right? If you heard the, the Juno Symphony's Verdi Requiem or the Mozart Requiem, you know, we, we did the DSE array in there as well. And so Mahler borrows this directly and uses the DSE array in a number of different forms to, to signal to the audience, whether you know it or not, to signal to the audience that we're talking about the day, the final judgment, the day of wrath. And you heard that in the horns, and it's going to come back in all sorts of different configurations here. Um, there are a couple other things that we're going to hear over and over again. One of them is uh, we call the fright fanfare. And this is the moment that woke Robin up in San Francisco all those years ago. Uh, and this is, is, it's sort of a scream. And so we call it the fright fanfare, and it's supposed to wake you up. Uh, but it's a, it's, it's a call of agony or, 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 or the dying person's. Um, cry out, and it sounds like this. That's, that's the fright motif. Just a couple more here. Um, the resurrection motif comes from the cross motif. So I'm going to play that for you so you can hear a little bit of that. And then that is going to turn into the choral entrance that that's where Robin totally broke down in that, in that earlier performance. So we're going to hear the resurrection motif here. And you can hear that, I mean, even, he even plays it in the trumpets, which brings us the cross motif in the first place. And then that turns into the first entrance of the, of the chorus, where they sing, Auferstein, ja, Auferstein, rise again, yes, rise again. <laughs> <laughs> 
that's the root of the, of the resurrection idea here. So let's talk about the first movement here. Um, the first movement is the giant movement the, of, um, of the funeral rites, and, and this is what Mahler wrote in one of his program notes. We stand by the coffin of a person well-loved. His whole life, his struggles, his passions, his sufferings, and his accomplishments on earth once more for the last time pass before us. And now, in this solemn and deeply stirring moment when the confusions and distractions of everyday life are lifted like a hood from our eyes, a voice of awe-inspiring solemnity chills our heart. A voice that, blinded by the mirage of everyday life, we usually ignore. What? What is life and what is death? Why did you live? Why did you suffer? Is it all nothing but a huge, frightful joke? Will we live on eternally? Do our life and death have a meaning? We must answer these questions in some way if we are to go on living, indeed, if we are to go on dying. He into whose life this call has once sounded must give an answer, and this answer I give in the final movement. So he even sets up that he's, he is asking the question about death. What is death? Why does it happen? And that he's going to strive over the course of this symphony to answer that question by the time we get to the last, last movement. I should mention that um, <clears throat> there, was a, there was an event that precipitated Mahler's finishing the symphony. He had written the first movement, and, um, and one of his friends, the great conductor von Bülow, died three years later. And Mahler went to the funeral for von Bülow. And, um, and he wrote to, uh, Mahler wrote to one of his other friends, he said, the way in which I received the inspiration for this work is very typical for the nature of artistic creativity. For a long time I had been pondering the idea of, in of including a choir in the last movement of a symphony. Only the fear that this might be considered an overt imitation of Beethoven made me hesitate again and again. When Bülow died, I attended his funeral. The mood I was in as I sat there thinking of the deceased was very much in the spirit of the work I had on my mind at the time. Then from the organ loft, the choir sang Klopstock's chorale, Resurrection. This hit me, like, hit me like lightning, and everything appeared clearly and distinctly before me. Every creative artist waits for that stroke of lightning. It is a kind of holy conception. So the death of his friend von Bülow and hearing the choir sing Resurrection prompted him to ask this question and then try to answer the question. So, the first movement itself, the symphony is in five sections, the first movement itself is in five sections. And that five, those five sections are the exposition, where we hear the funeral march, a lyric theme, the cross symbol, and more funeral music. Then we have a second section, which is a development, which is introduced, then has a little pastoral, develops the cross symbol, and then returns to the main motives of the first movement. Then we have a second complete development, and this is where that modernist impulse takes hold. So even though Mahler is working in the symphony form, it's not traditional to have two developments. So he, rather than proportion in thirds, he really proportions in halves. His exposition in the first development is about half the piece, then his second development in the recapitulation and the coda are the other half of the piece. The second development starts with a lament, this kind of sad cry and importantly, anticipates the finale. And it's amazing to me, actually, that he wrote this piece prior to conceiving how this finale was going to work, because the second development includes all of those little motifs that I played you examples of, the, the Dies Irae theme, the cross motive, the resurrection motive, and the eternity motive. Then we go to a recapitulation, which repeats the material of the exposition, and we have a little coda. And I do want to play for you, even though you've heard all of these themes, I want to play for you the beginning of the of the, of the first movement because I think it's one of the most amazing and iconic moments in music and it's, it's part of what made me fall in love with this piece right away. This is the beginning of the first movement. <laughs> That's the beginning of the first movement. Kind of frightening. I mean, it's, it's terrifying, really, in, in, the, in the sound. You get that, that tremolo in the upper, upper strings, and it's the basses and the cellos. You play this da 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 dum Really neat. The second movement, Mahler writes, this is a memory, a ray of sunlight, pure and cloudless, out of the departed's life. You must surely have had the experience of burying someone dear to you, and then perhaps on the way back, some long-forgotten hour of shared happiness suddenly rose before your inner eye. 
sending, as it were, a sunbeam into your soul, not overcast by any shadow, and you almost forgot what had just taken place. And I put up, the picture I put up here is, is by Gustav Klimt, and I like that, that image because it sort of fits with the idea of the sunlight of this memory. And uh, so because we are remembering happy things, He's really changed the tenor of the piece significantly. And this is a moment where I feel like you have to know his program note because otherwise it, it, it really is jarring after that first funeral march to go into this very happy memory. Um, Otto Klimperer said about this movement, it's not Schubert, it's a man who remembers Schubert and there's a big difference. And I think that's a really great description because it's a nostalgic view back to one of this kind of lighter, folkier sounds. This is a dance-like pastoral movement. It's a very simple rondo form, which really just means repeating different sections uh, with two themes and then variations on those two themes. And I'll play you the two themes so that when you're in the hall listening to you, you'll, you'll be able to identify those two themes. This is the first theme. I'm struck in these two pictures how much Mahler and Schubert really look alike, too. <laughs> Maybe I should grow my hair back out again. <laughs> this is the second theme. And so Mahler just brings us back and forth between those two pretty, pretty simple, uh, simple little themes. I do think it's kind of interesting. He, he talks about um, variation, and, and Mahler himself never liked exact repetition. And so um, he wrote a, a letter to one of his friends, and he pointed out that as opposed to the Romanticists' ideas of variation, which tended to be strict and very formally based, he considered his own variations to be ornamentations, paraphrases, and entwinements rather than a subtle following and working through the same cycle of notes. And so his idea, Mahler's idea of variation is not to just repeat the same idea done a little bit differently, but to actually work from a kernel of idea and, and change it a bit. So even though we will come back to these ideas in A1 and B1 and A2, they're going to sound a little bit different each time, but you'll be able to identify where those things come through. The third movement, I think, is very interesting and, and was a little bit puzzling to me, honestly, until I started digging a little bit deeper. Um, Mahler says, when you awaken from that blissful dream of the second movement and are forced to return to this tangled life of ours, it may easily happen that this surge of life, ceaselessly in motion, never resting, never comprehensible, suddenly seems eerie like the billowing of dancing figures in a brightly lit ballroom that you gaze into from outside in the dark and from a distance so great that you can no longer hear the music. I think it's interesting that he's representing in music what it's like to not be able to hear the music. Then the turning and twisting movement of the couple seems senseless. You must imagine that to one who has lost his identity and his happiness, the world looks like this, distorted and crazy as if reflected in a concave mirror. Life then becomes meaningless. Utter disgust for every form of existence and evolution seizes him in an iron grip, and he cries out in a scream of anguish. And that scream of anguish is that fright motif that I played for you earlier, and that's going to come at the end of this movement. Now, this movement actually sounds pretty happy, um, and it's based on a song, uh, the Sermon of St. Anthony of Padua to the Fishes which is a poem from Des Knaben Wunderhorn that Mahler set for piano and voice. And in this song, St. Anthony preaches to the fishes after he's found the church empty. And um, Mahler thinks it's a satire on humanity and a parable of senselessness. <laughs> and so he considers this, this whole idea to be kind of funny. And I'm going to play for you the song, a little bit of the song, not a lot of it, but a little bit of the song so you can hear our, a singer with piano singing the song. And those of you symphony musicians who are sitting out here, you're going to recognize it, and then I'll, for the rest of you, I'll play the, the clip with the orchestra. This is a little bit of the song, St. Anthony. <laughs> 
Gloria, we could still use it a little louder if you're back there. You can turn it up just a little bit more. Um, so the two sections here are, this is very much in the same form, a little rondo, simple rondo form, like the, like the second movement. Um, it's an A and a B. A sections are based on St. Anthony. The B sections are a folksy dance. They're very much a, a, a German Lendler style dance. Um, then we come back and repeat A, and then we repeat B again, and this time we end with that scream, that fright fanfare that, that Mahler has talked about. Uh, let's hear just a little bit of those, just a couple seconds of those A and B sections. So this A section is going to be based right on the song we just heard. Now remember how Mahler mentioned that life goes on and on and on and on and on? So he's written what is sort of a perpetual motion machine. And, and that line never really stops throughout this entire scherzo movement. It just keeps going and going and going. The second movement goes into that dance. Oops. One of the things that I find really interesting about this, and I didn't really get until, get until after talking with, with Robin about modernism, it's always puzzled me a little bit this, this high and low that we get constantly alternating in Mahler, because the first movement is very, very deep. I mean, it's deep music, it's powerful. I mean, it's out of the tradition of Beethoven, taken to a logical extension you know, toward the end of the century. Then we get movements like these inner movements that are so simple that are based on dances that sound very country-like. In fact, in the third movement, there are these sections that sound like klezmer. Um, you can hear the, kind of the Czech or the bohemian sounds in there. And I, I've always been a little bit puzzled, but one of the things that Robin mentioned about this modernism is this idea that there's really no, no true aesthetic difference between the high and the low, because there's no um, uh, inherent uh, value difference between types of music. And so in that respect, once again, Mahler is being quite modern in incorporating these things. It does, however, make it in some ways much simpler and sort of simpler and easier to hear when we hear these second and third movements. Now we move into the fourth movement, which is, to my mind, the five most beautiful minutes of music ever written. And I know that's a strong statement, but I really believe that, actually, I really do. The fourth movement is the Urlicht, or primeval light. I put another klimt image up there. Actually, this klimt image, in interestingly enough, was inspired by Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, and yet it, it sort of fits with Mahler's Second Symphony. And all Mahler says about the fourth movement is the moving voice of naive faith sounds in our ears. I am from God and will return to God. The dear God will give me a light, will light me to eternal blessed life. And I think this is an interesting take on Mahler's personal struggle with the idea of death. Because I think unlike composers like Mozart or Verdi, um, who were very solid in their faith, uh, Mahler, like, more like Brahms, is questioning. And, but, but unlike Brahms, Mahler wants to be comforted, and he wants to believe, and that's going to be, play an important role in the last movement. Um, Mahler said himself about this, the questioning and agonized searching of the soul for God and for its own eternal existence. And I'm going to play just a few seconds here of the Urlicht from his song cycle for piano and voice and mezzo-soprano. Um, this song, both the piano version and the orchestral version, is in, in what we call a song form. It has a little introduction, and then it has three short stanzas. And each stanza is in a different style because each stanza represents different 
text. So let's hear just a little bit. This is actually out of the second stanza of, uh, of the song. This is for piano and voice. Now, this is the only segment that I'm going to play you a larger example, and I'm going to play the whole fourth movement for you because it's only five minutes long. And because when you are actually sitting in the auditorium, you're not going to be able to read the translation, see the German and the English together. And so I put them up so you could see the German and read the translation. And so we're just going to listen, we're just going to listen to this entire, this movement in its entirety. It begins with the, with the, the mezzo-soprano, or the alto soloist, we hear a little choral in the brass, then the strings accompany and the winds accompany for the second and third systems. So we're just going to listen to this in its entirety. <laughs> 
And then we get the scream, which wakes everybody up. Ah, it's just gorgeous. Okay, the fifth movement. We're almost done here. I'll finish up the fifth movement quickly, and then we'll, if anybody has to go, they can go, and we'll take some questions, too. In the fifth movement, Mahler says, once more we must confront terrifying questions. The movement starts with the same dreadful scream of anguish that ended the scherzo. The voice of the caller is heard, and this is going to be important. <clears throat> the end of every living thing has come. The last judgment is at hand, and the horror of the day of days has come, <coughs> come upon us. The earth trembles, the last trumpet sounds, the graves burst open. All the creatures struggle out of the ground, moaning and trembling. Now they march in a mighty procession, rich and poor, peasants and kings, the whole church with bishops and popes, all have the same fear, all cry and tremble alike, because in the eyes of God there are no just men. The cry for mercy and forgiveness sounds fearful in our ears. The wailing becomes gradually more terrible, our senses desert us, all consciousness dies as the eternal judge approaches. The trumpets of the apocalypse ring out. Finally, after all have left their empty graves and the earth lies silent and deserted, there comes only the long-drawn note of the bird of death. Even it finally dies. What happens now is far from expected. Everything has ceased to exist. The gentle sounds of a chorus of saints and heavenly hosts is then heard. Soft and simple, the words gently swell up. Rise again, yea, you shall rise again. Then the glory of God comes into sight. A wondrous light strikes us to the heart. All is quiet and blissful. Lo and behold, there is no judgment, no sinners, no just men, no great and no small. There is no punishment and no reward. A feeling of overwhelming love fills us with blissful knowledge and illuminates our existence. Now, the last movement is huge, as I mentioned. It's 35 minutes long. And its structure is huge as well. Um, it is in really f four main parts. It has an introduction that starts with the fright fa fanfare that you all know. Then we hear the eternity and ascension themes together. Then we get the announcement of Judgment Day, the one calling in the wilderness. And I think this is really interesting and, and, and fun about the piece. The caller who announces the Day of Judgment comes from the French horns off stage. So somewhere back in the back of the auditorium, somewhere out of sight and barely in hearing, you will hear the horns do this. And this is going to be pretty soft. And it's wonderful because Mahler creates this effect out of all of this noise that occurs and then it sort of comes down to nothing and you hear these horns off in the distance calling. There is another idea and this idea is, is, relative, is, is, is new to the last movement. It's not included in the other four movements. And that is the section that we call the entreaty or I call the entreaty. And the entreaty you will hear when we get to it the third time um, is the alto and she sings the words O glaube, O glaube mein Herz, O glaube, which means O oh, believe, O oh, believe my heart, believe. And so even after all of the rest of what Mahler has done in setting this up, he still comes back to this idea of believe, and he's really saying, help me believe. Uh, he's not saying save me, he's saying help me believe. Uh, and that is this kind of passionate um, asymmetrical motif that's syncopated and kind of constantly shifting, and it sounds like this. Constantly yearning and sort of pathetic dida dida quality to it. Then we get another announcement of the caller, and there's this wonderful moment where the percussionists get to go crazy on stage, and they play all of the instruments they have and rumble as loud as they can. And the idea is that the earth is shaking and the graves are opening up. And when that happens, Mahler takes the Dies Irae and turns it into a march and this is the march of all of the dead who are processing forward to be judged. <laughs>
the march that he bases on the Dies Irae. Then we get a collapse, the fright fanfare comes back, we get the entreaty again, then there's a big climax of the fright fanfare, and the eternity and ascension thing theme happens, and when we come around to the, to the recapitul re recapitulation where we come back to the main ideas, now we have the great roll call, the true apocalypse, although in some respects Mahler hedges his bets because rather than Calling it the true apocalypse, he often also calls it the vision of the apocalypse over the final judgment, I think, which also sort of fits into this idea of not being quite into one religious tradition or another. The collar motif, and I'm not going to play the whole thing here for you, um, comes back with the horns much stronger this time, and then we hear the trumpets as well, the last trumpet shall sound, and it ends with the, the bird of death, these little bird call trills that then fade out to absolutely nothing, and I'll just play the beginning of this clip here. still have a little bit of rumbling in the background. So the trumpets begin to sound, and it goes on like that. Um, I'm going to skip the entreaty right now. You'll hear that when you hear the performance, but I do want to play just a little bit of the end. I'm not going to play the whole conclusion, but this is the variation of, what, of the chorus entrance that we played earlier for you in, in its final climactic glory. Uh, builds up, we get the eternity theme, bells, and then transcendence. This is the, the end. <laughs> It's just a magnificent piece. It really is truly a magnificent piece. Just a couple more words on this piece. You know, walking through all of the structure, I think, makes it um, much more comprehensible in its large form. But I, I think this is a piece very much like a Shakespeare play. I mean, you can go into Midsummer Night's Dream, you don't have to know anything about it, and you can thoroughly enjoy and get everything about the, the, the play. And even with the gigantic structure of the Mahler Second Symphony, Robin and I both had that same experience. You can go into that and just be, be washed along with what he is, is writing. And, and that fits well into the idea of the, of the modernist composer that um, he's creating a world in this composition. And it's not a, just about sort of ripping things out of his soul and putting them on display for the rest of us that he is actually creating a soul in the creation of this entirety of the world, and, and that we tune into it and are carried along. And um, I used to say, before I talked to Robin about this, I used to say, um, Mahler takes us on a journey, and I still think that's true. He starts us on a journey when that, that funeral march at the very beginning and the outset then takes us through the emotions of dealing with the concepts of death and brings us all the way around to this eventual transcendence and resurrection. Thank you very much. We sure appreciate your being here. If you have to go, we're totally fine with that. But if you have any questions, I think this is a good time for that. So for either Robin or myself, we'd be happy to take some questions right now. The, uh, the lecture? I, that is a question I can't answer. <laughs> Gloria can, or somebody from the back. I'm not sure. Do you know when it'll be available online? In a week or two. After the concert's done. <laughs>
Any other questions, comments? Bill. Bill's question is, is, is my appreciation for the fourth movement shared by other musicologists? And my answer is, I don't know, and I don't particularly care. <laughs> no, I, I, I don't know. Um, it is certainly uh, a movement that is central to the piece because it's so important. The text itself is so important. And, and as, as I mentioned, Mahler you know, felt like he had gotten to the end of what he could express in music and had to resort to the word. And so when he gets to the word, it's because he said everything he can say, and now he needs actual words to, to express that sentiment. And I think that that, that, that five-minute segment is, going to, is, is really what leads us into the entire dramatic shape of that last movement, where we're kind of constantly going back and forth between fear and entreaty and ultimately ascendance in that. This word, hello, microphone. And um, then De Rosen Cavalier was his return to romanticism. And when you played the last two lines of the fourth movement, all I could hear was the trio from De Rosen Cavalier. Does yeah. that remind you of that at all? Yeah, oh, yeah, it does. And, oh, and you know, the. Um, it's, it's funny that the players felt that this was a crime against orchestration because actually I, I think one of the things that is so incredibly stunning about this piece is the orchestration, which is the way that Mahler has taken this material and arrayed it for the forces of the orchestra, this very, very large orchestra that he uses. And Strauss, um, Strauss was... Strauss was actually, in some ways, an acolyte of Mahler's and, and conducted Mahler's works. In fact, Strauss conducted one of the first performances of this piece, so you know, quite a bit before he wrote Rosen Cavalier. But I think, actually, probably more to the point would be that both Strauss and Mahler were influenced by Wagner. And so they both really held in mind Wagner's use of the orchestra and the horns and the way he sort of shaped his harmonies. Where I would say they differ in some ways is that Wagner was working his way toward atonality. And Wagner became so chromatic in the way that he wrote chords that really he was pushing us past tonality in the way that we tend to think of kind of our, our regular major and minor tonalities. And Strauss follows that with Salome and is going even further into atonality. And then Schoenberg and Berg and Webern are going to go and take that to its logical extreme and actually dispense with tonality. And Mahler really returns to a deeper sense of tonality and, and does not go nearly as far into atonality as Strauss does and, and, and the later Viennese composers do. And so, um, yeah, I, I think they're very reminiscent of, of each other. And, and, uh, and Rosenkavalier is, is really neo-romantic because it's a, it's a return to the ideas of romanticism after we've already reached that sort of breaking point of tonality. So that, that's my take on that. Other uh, questions or comments? Yes? Are we bringing in other people to put this on? Yes, we are. Um, where, where are we pulling them from? Uh, the, the Juno Symphony always brings in um, a certain group of, of people from out of town just to fill some spots that we don't have, some holes that we have in, in the orchestra, and, and actually to add uh, strength in the string sections, which just require a few more players. And uh, our players come from all over. Um, quite a few come from Southeast, from Sitka and from Ketchikan, a couple from Huna, from Haines. Um, and then we're bringing a group from, um, from Anchorage and from Fairbanks. So most of them come from inside Alaska. There are a couple players that come from Seattle, and our harpist comes from down in my neck of the woods, down in, in Redding. So, yeah. Bruce, yes. Yeah. Um, I'll have to look it up. I don't remember exactly. It's it's a fairly early work. Robin, do you remember where Kinder Kinder Toten Leader? Bob, you remember where Kinder Toten Leader falls? Or 1907? Yeah, I don't know. I, I I'm not sure. Kinder Toten Leader was um, the songs on the death of children, and um, 
And it, it has kind of, I mean, once again, we've talked about how Mahler's obsessed with death, and so he, he goes to these sets of poems. His wife, Alma, begs him, is also superstition, begs him, superstitious, begs him not to write the piece. And, and shortly thereafter, actually, is when his, his daughter dies. So it has to be a, a, middle, a middle work, at least, uh, because this is before he met Alma. So it has to be after the Second Symphony. Um, there's a funny story. I mean, it's Kinder Toten Leader is not a terribly funny piece, <laughs> by any means. Uh, but my agent, I was talking to my agent one time, and I said, I notice you don't have any singers on your roster. And he said, oh, singers. And I said, well, why not? And he said, well, one time I was persuaded against my will to, to hire a singer. One of the conductors said, you know, this young singer, she's fantastic. You really have to, you have to, have to get her on your roster. And so he took her on his roster. And she was getting performances, and, and she got signed on for a performance of Kinder Toten Leader. And, and about a week before the performance, she called the conductor, not the agent, and, and, and bailed out on the performance. And, and so he called her, my agent called her, and said, what are you doing? You can't just bail out on the performance. And he, she said, oh, I finally learned the piece, and it's just too sad. <laughs> so I don't, I don't want to sing it. <laughs> He said, did you not look at the title of the piece? <laughs> it's called Songs on the Death of Children. So he doesn't represent any more singers. Yes. Did Mahler come to the US? Yes, Mahler did come to the US. In fact, Mahler uh, came to the Metropolitan Opera House. When things were starting to look pretty bad in Vienna, uh, he, he came to the Met and conducted the Met for at least a year. But uh, there was another conductor, young conductor, who you probably know his name, Arturo Toscanini, who was also brought to the Met, and the two of them did not get along at all. Actually, Mahler didn't get along with any other conductor, so I, I don't blame Toscanini. Mahler did not get along with other conductors. And so after a year at the Met, um, he took some engagements with what was called the New York Symphony, and that following year they reformed into the New York Philharmonic. And so he was actually technically the first music director of the New York Philharmonic, uh, but he only lasted a year. His health was not good then. And so after, after two, two and a half years in New York, he went back to, uh, to Vienna. He did. He performed an, a number of his own works, including the Second Symphony, actually, with the New York Philharmonic. Yeah. Other questions, comments? Yes. Who's my favorite composer of all time? Brahms. Uh, Brahms has been my favorite composer of all time. But I have to say that uh, this, this work is my favorite work now. The Second Symphony has become my favorite work. It's displaced Brahms' Fourth Symphony. Um, Ma I have an, uh, Mahler's interesting to me. I, I love Mahler, but I can't, I said in the beginning, I can't claim to be a Mahler expert, and in fact, I don't um, personally actually even know the late works very well. Um, I know the first five symphonies and the first song cycles, like Wayfarer songs, but I just have not delved deeply yet into the sixth through ninth symphonies, although I do, I do like Das Lied von der Erde. Um, and in some ways, those later symphonies become much more modernist, and they don't fit my personal aesthetic quite as well, which is not to say that when I start exploring them that I won't fall in love with those works as well. Uh, but there's something about Mahler that just infuses itself into my consciousness when I'm working on a, a Mahler symphony and, and kind of takes over my musical thought. And, and I think part of it is his, his harmonies are very simple for the most part. And he layers a lot of very simple ideas on top of each other. So you heard, for instance, the, the, um, the, the uh, eternity themes and the ascension themes, which are very simple melodic ideas. I mean, they're almost childlike in their simplicity. And then over the top of that, he'll put another simple idea, which you heard, which is the upper strings going bom, bom, bom. So you have the horns going dee, bom, 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 bom. And on the top, bom, bom, bom. And then he starts layering more of these little simple ideas on top of each other. And I find that they just work their way into my, into my ears. And, and then when I'm trying to work on other composers, like Brahms, my favorite composer, uh, these Mahler songs, just, they drive them out. And it, it kind of, it, 
it, it's almost like fever dream feeling. And, and so when we finish this piece, when we finish this work next Sunday, I, I cannot go back and think about it for a while. I have to just put it away entirely, even though I, I love it so deeply. And, and I played this three years ago, and then when I got it back out this year to really start working on it, it's, I, it's like falling in love again with this piece. Every, every bar, you know, I can spend so much time falling in love again with this piece. But the, I have to put it away, because then I, ca I can't do anything else if I, if I keep thinking about it. So it's an all-encompassing kind of piece. John. Yeah. Yeah. The Shostakovich fifth? Yeah? I might have. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I, I tends to, my favorite symphony tends to be what I'm working on at the time. Although, although, I just two weeks ago conducted Tchaikovsky's fourth symphony. And Mahler's second definitely surpasses Tchaikovsky four in my head while I'm working on that, no question. I, I would point out one of the things that, that is kind of a nice circle for me in this, is that when I started working on Mahler II, um, we were house-sitting at the Ruddies. And so that was three years ago, and um, out the road, and just with the, the spectacular view, just spectacular view. And so I would sit in Bill's office upstairs and, and just study this, I mean, reading this score and hearing this music and watching humpback whales go by and, and, and seeing the mountains and the snow and the water. And, and it's, it's a very appropriate uh, foil to this piece because Mahler said, you know, Mahler said, I compose the world. If you, you know, if you want to see the world, look at one of my symphonies. And so you, you kind of need something like Alaska as a foil to what he's doing there. And so it's a nice circle for me because I studied the piece at, at the Ruddy's house, I went down, I conducted it down there, now I'm back and conducting it here and having, having really begun. I mean, that will always be infused in my experience with the symphony, is that experience of sitting there and looking out and, and, and seeing the glory of Southeast. You know, that's, that's part of my experience with Mahler, too. John. Uh, John asked if I have a favorite CD or performance of Mahler too, and I, I, I don't. Yeah, no, I don't. I um, it's a tough one. Um, Mahler, Mahler was a fastidious marker of his scores, and and he was um, he wanted to tell the conductors what to do. I mean, he was a conductor himself. He knew the liberties that conductors would take with music, and so he wanted to avoid that. And so he wrote extensive, extensive notes in the score, and very picky, picky notes. Like, you know, he'll say things like, you know, from here on, for the next 47 bars, I want you to accelerate imperceptibly so that no one can feel that, but by the time you reach this point, you have to be at this tempo. Right, that's difficult, and and he meant it, and so you have to study and really work on that. Um, but because maybe because of or in spite of his markings, um, different conductors' performances of his works tend to be dramatically different. And uh, I I I can't say that there's any one performance that I find to be the 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 one performance. And in fact, I think it was Mahler himself who said there is no definitive performance. And, uh, and that, that was one of my teacher, my conducting teacher's real uh, lessons for us. There is no definitive performance, that every single performance is unique to its surroundings and its circumstances. That might be a very modernist idea, actually. Um, but um, there are conductors, I really love the way they handle Mahler. Uh, Heitink, Bernard Heitink. I think is a great Mahler conductor. And he conducts a great Mahler orchestra, and that's the Concertgebouw Orchestra uh, in Amsterdam, and he recorded several times with them. I think Claudio Abbado is a very good Mahler conductor. I think Ricardo Chailly is a very good Mahler conductor. I do not like Bernstein's Mahlers. And, and Bernstein did an awful lot to expose Mahler to the world. I think that's great, but I do not like his Mahler uh, renderings. I think they're very indulgent, and um, there's enough there. You don't have to do anything else to it to, to get, I mean, uh, 
well, enough said about that. I, I, I think, I, I think Hightink is, is terrific. And so even though I don't necessarily, um, wouldn't say that his is necessarily the, the best Mahler two, I did buy his box set of all 10 Mahler symphonies <laughs> because I think of, of the 10, maybe they're the best. So, other questions or comments? Well, thank you very much. Robin, thank you very much for your <laughs> part of this. And I, thank you. And I, I do hope to see you next week, and there is no, nothing like seeing this piece done live. There is nothing to compare to seeing this piece done live. So, next Saturday and Sunday. Hope to see you there.